Hi, this is Mrs. Ofton, and this is the final video in the Pre-Calculus Statistics Unit, Video 5. This video discusses variability and sources of bias in experiments and um, observational studies. So by the end of this video, you should be able to describe variability in a set of data and know the difference between high variability and low variability and what's good and bad about both high variability and low variability, also what can cause bias, and how can we combat bias. So first of all, what is variability? Variability is one way of describing the spread of a data set. And you can see that I have two data sets shown in the slide. Now data sets can have high variability or low variability. On the left-hand side, the data are clustered together and it appears to have low variability. You can see that many of the readings are close to the mean, 25.16. The standard deviation of 1.46 is really not very large compared to the range of the data. In a data set with high variability, the data are very spread out. So we see this in the sample on the right-hand side. In this high variability, Set, the standard deviation is much larger and there is a much greater spread of the sample measurements further out from the mean of the set of data at 28.32. So a lot of times you want to have low variability if you're working in production facilities or if you have something that you want to turn out the same every single time. If, for example, these represented our original example from back in the earlier videos of the bags of Doritos, then it would be much preferable to know that almost all of my bags of Doritos had 25 bags of chip or 25 chips in them. You know, if a few have 28, a couple have 23, that's all right. But if most of them have 24, 25, 26, nobody is going to feel cheated when they open their bag of Doritos. That would be an example of low variability. On the other hand, high variability is not desirable. If you are taking something that says it should have 25 chips, and it turns out that a whole bunch of them have 22, some have 31, people are going to get confused. This could indicate a problem in your production line. If you are producing things like auto parts, or airplane parts, it is even more important that you have low variability in your outputs. Okay. Now, when we've conducted experiments or when we conduct observational studies, bias, as we've discussed before, can be a really big problem. So what are the things that can cause bias? First of all, if the sample is non-representative, if the sample does not represent your population, that can cause bias. I mentioned before that convenience samples are especially prone to this non-representative sample bias, but other types of samples can be as well. Also, undercoverage can cause bias. Undercoverage is when a certain segment of the population is underrepresented in the sample. So, even if we have a simple random sample of all seniors at Greater Lowell, it could turn out that we didn't survey a single person from the cosmetology shop. Well, that could result in under coverage. Reliability of the instrument, if we're using a survey, are we getting reliable results? If we're using a test, are the questions well written? If you are using a scale to weigh people on. Does it weigh accurately? These issues of reliability of the instrument can also cause bias in our measurements. Additionally, there can be investigator bias. You, as the researcher, may come to a question with preconceived ideas. If you are totally convinced that the Doritos brand has been shorting you on chips all these years, you may already have an idea that their bags do weigh less than six ounces, and you may be desperate to prove that. 
in the case of an experiment, bias can be caused when a treatment is not applied fully or properly. So if you have somebody who is supposed to be taking a new medication once every four hours for 10 days, but they don't do that, then that can bias your results. Additionally, there's many, many statistical tests to choose from. If you choose the wrong st statistical test and it is not appropriate for the situation, it can cause bias in your results. So the question then becomes, how can we eliminate bias? And how can we as consumers of data note where bias could occur? So how can we combat bias? First of all, it's important to carefully design a study. You want to write a good question. Now, a good question is one that you can answer with your data and one that isn't demonstrating that you already have preconceived notions. If you write a question like, why is it always boys who are an in-house? That's indicating that you have certain beliefs about boys that might not be held up by the data. You could overlook that data. You might want to change your question to write, what are the characteristics of students who are in in-house for two or more days? When you write questions, you want to consider if people are likely to answer those questions truthfully. Sometimes in certain um, social science research, they even insert special lie detector questions into surveys to see if people will answer them in certain ways. And then they can know if the person is lying on the survey. You want to sample carefully and be clear about who you have sampled and who your population is when you write your report. If you sample only HVAC students, then the results that you may get may not apply beyond the HVAC shop. So you want to be sure that you report that when you're writing your final report. If you're doing an experiment, you also want to think about people who have dropped out or who refuse to participate and how those people are different from those persons who have chosen to participate and have chosen to persevere through the end of the experiment. This is especially important with human subjects. You also want to consider your own biases and beliefs when you are selecting subjects and when you are analyzing the data. When you start your research, do you already have a preconceived idea about how the research is going to turn out? If you have that bias, it could impact how you select subjects, how you write your question, and how you analyze the data. Finally, a good knowledge of statistics is important in combating bias because you want to be sure to choose the correct statistical methods. Whether that's qualitative research or quantitative research, which is what we've mostly looked at here, you want to be sure that you are choosing the correct method and analyzing your data in the correct way to help with combating bias. Since this is the last video in our statistics unit, I hope that it's been helpful to you in learning more about statistics and becoming a better consumer of all the data that we encounter in our day-to-day -day life.